Welcome everyone. I would now like to take you through our last formal session followed by the question and answer period. This is a session on the dresser discovery. Um, for those of you who may not have seen our earlier presentation on Kirkland Museum, I don't know how much change there's been in the participant list, but I just thought I would summarize again um, that our temporary exhibition at Kirkland Museum, of which I'm the co-curator, is titled Truth, Beauty, and Power, Christopher Dresser and the Aesthetic Movement. And it's on view in Denver through January 2nd. We would love for you to visit if you're here. Um, and we are so grateful to Dorman Museum and Harry Lyons for their kindness in helping us put this all together, but also for their help with that exhibition. It was truly their assistance that allowed us to attribute the chair. And so this um, section is going to be the story of that chair attribution and how an image from a panel in the Dorman Museum in Middlesbrough started a conversation about the attribution of Kirkland Museum's five-legged chair on display 4,500 miles away in Denver. So please continue to add questions to the Q&A button below as we listen to my colleague, Becca Goodrum, co-curator of the exhibition, uh, Louise Harrison, the curatorial officer at the Dorman Museum, and then Harry Lyons, um, who is an author, collector, and authority on all things Christopher Dresser, as they tell us a little bit more about our chair. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Becca Goodrum. I am the Collections and Research Manager at Kirkland Museum of Fine and Decorative Art in Denver, Colorado, and co-curator of the exhibition, Truth, Beauty, and Power, Christopher Dresser and the Aesthetic Movement that you can see behind me. I'm here to tell you the story of how with the help of international experts, we attributed a chair in our collection to the man of the hour, Christopher Dresser. The story all began when our founding director and curator Hugh Grant, not the actor, purchased a fabulous chair from Toomey & Co auctioneers. It was unmarked and unattributed, but Hugh thought the chair was so striking that the museum had to have it. What we did know about the chair is it was retailed at Liberties. For those of you who may not know, Liberty & Co often referred to as Liberties is a luxury department store in London that became known for avant-garde designs. We spent months trying to track down a designer for our chair. We reached out to various experts, but no one could give us any major leads. There were some names thrown around, William Birch, Edward Godwin, Leonard Wybird, E.G. Punnett, etc., but nothing definitive enough to tie the chair to any one of these men. There are fragments of an exhibition label and a gallery label on the chairs, but those two produced few clues. The exhibition label fragment is blue and white, and the only word you can read on it is exposition. I tried to find a match for this label, but with the limited fragment I have, I haven't had any luck. If anyone out there knows anything about this label, feel free to reach out to us. I would love to hear from you. Same goes for the gallery label on the chair. We know the label is from Bud Holland in Chicago, who was an art dealer, but we could find no record of this chair and his records specifically. The upholstery on the chair was another mystery all on its own. We believe our chair was reupholstered at some point, but we don't know when. It had originally, or I had originally credited, credited Arthur Silver with the design of the fabric because that seemed to be the consensus. However, after further research, I saw on the website for the Museum of Domestic Design and Architecture that more research had been done by dresser expert, Harry Lyons, that proved that the Hera pattern retailed at Liberties was not designed by Arthur Silver as previously thought, but by Christopher Dresser. We ordered Mr. Lyon's book, Christopher Dresser Textiles, which you'll see right here, and found the evidence he uncovered to be overwhelming. This was such exciting new information 
But because we knew the chair was reupholstered at some point in its lifetime, it didn't solve the mystery of the designer of the chair itself, at least not yet. During further research for the dresser exhibition, I began to wonder if he could have a larger connection to our chair than just the gorgeous peacock upholstery. I read Vidar Halen's book titled Christopher Dresser, which you'll see here. And on page 71, he explains that the cabinet maker, which was a journal or magazine published in the late 19th century, illustrated a few dresser designs for the inauguration of Dresser's Art Furnishers Alliance in 1881. The Art Furnishers Alliance, just briefly, was founded by Christopher Dresser, George Chubb, and Edward Cope and others. It was a retail venture where Dresser could promote his design ideals and supply affordable Eastern goods to the masses. It was a short-lived venture, however, going into liquidation in 1883. One of the designs that Vidar Halen shows in the book um, from 1881 is a Thebes stool, which was inspired by an Egyptian chair at the British Museum. Many artists had copied this particular chair, but I was unaware that Dresser was one of them. The Liberty style Thebes stool, as well as the Dresser designed Thebes stool, have certain similarities to our five-legged chair, and this information piqued my interest, although I didn't know enough at the time to take this any further. The final clue for me happened while I was researching the Art Furnishers Alliance and a Flickr image came up. It was a photo of an advertisement for three chairs sold at Liberty's from the Art Furnishers Alliance stock. The image shows three chairs. The one on the left is a five-legged chair with a pentagon-shaped seat. It immediately caught my eye and I knew I had to know more. I had looked for this sort of chair with this configuration of legs and with the particular shaped seat and had never seen anything this similar. I knew that the AFA sold Eastern Arts and Crafts objects as well as objects designed by Dresser himself, so the AFA clue in this post tied back directly to Dresser for me. The image was tagged Dorman Museum. I was familiar with this museum through my research. They come up all the time when you Google or look up Dresser, and I knew they might have a Dresser expert on staff. I decided to email the museum which felt like a long shot, honestly, but I was hopeful that they could help. I sent them a photo of the Flickr image and a photo of our five-legged chair and asked if they had any information that connected our chair to Dresser. A few days later, I heard back from Ms. Harrison, who was kind enough to reach out to Mr. Lyons on our behalf. Louise is the curatorial officer at Dorman Museum. Louise, would you like to take it from here? Thank you very much, Becca. Um, so I'm Louise Harrison. I'm a curatorial officer at the Dorman Museum, which is the home to the Dresser Collection, the largest public collection in the world of works by Christopher Dresser. But the Dorman Museum um, is 116 years old, and I'd like to give you some background about our connection with Dresser over those years. Um, our main connection is through the Linthorpe Art Pottery, which is literally just, just up the road from the museum. Um, so, so that's always been sort of the focal point of our collections in terms of dresser. The Dorman Museum was opened in 1904. Uh, it's a purpose-built museum. It was a gift to the town of Middlesbrough by the Iron Master, Sir Arthur Dorman. And if the full title is the Dorman Memorial Museum, because it was built in memory of his son who died in the South African War. And it sort of started off as a natural sciences museum, a bit of ethnography and a few sort of local quirky bygones. Um, but we, the museum had only been open two years when we had our first Lidlock Pottery exhibition. Um, it, was, it was all loans from private collectors. I guess um, 16 years didn't seem a long enough period of time for it to seem like museum objects to collect. Um, but the catalogue the catalog sort of makes a big deal of the connection between Christopher Dresser and the Lidlock Pottery and sort of claims that that was how John Harrison approached uh, Christopher Dresser because he wanted high quality art pottery of his, of his well, what was his brickworks that became the art pottery. But the Dorman Museum sort of permanent collection of import pottery, um, we didn't stop collecting it until the 1920s. And because our curator, Frank LG, was an archaeologist, it was sort of put on display as a sort of history of Tees Valley pottery, so from prehistory up to modern times, so it wasn't really set into sort of decorative arts context. 
didn't have um, many pieces that, that were non-Linthorpe that were connected with Dresser. We, we did, the, the Dawn Museum did play a small part in the revival of Dresser's reputation. There were four Linthorpe pottery pieces on loan from the Dorman at the Victorian Albert Museum's Victorian and Edwardian Decorative Arts Exhibition in 1952. And then in 1979, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of Dresser's death and 100 years since the foundation of the Linthorpe pottery, uh, we collaborated with the Arkwright Arts Trust on a major dresser exhibition. And so from the 70s onwards, we did sort of slowly build up our dresser collection. Um, and by the time we had a major redevelopment in 2003, we were able to put together a sort of small permanent display to go to dresser in our new Linthorpe Pottery Gallery, but it was, it was a very small case. So at that stage, it, the, the most of the dresser material that we had on display was all in thought pottery. But as 2004 was approaching, um, it was just going to be our big centenary year, and obviously it was 100 years since dresser's death. So we wanted to put together another prestigious uh, exhibition like the Camden Arts one that we'd had. Um, and we did hope to borrow material from the V&A, but of course they had the same idea of, of putting on a dresser exhibition. So that was when our senior curator, Ken Sedman, first got into contact with Mr. Lyons. And he absolutely came to the rescue um, with loans of his own material, but he also put us into contact with private collectors. So in the end, we were able to put together, I think for the size of the museum, it was a very impressive exhibition, uh, Christopher Dresser, the first industrial designer. So once again, we'd had Dresser's amazing designs on display in the Dorman Museum. But then once again, we had to give them back at the end of the exhibition. But it did stimulate a drive with its staff um, to really build up our small dresser collection. Um, but with our very limited acquisitions budget, it was, a, it was a slow process. And as dresser's reputation increased, so unfortunately from our point of view, did the value of his works. Um, so it was absolutely amazing when Harry Lyons approached us to offer his collection to the Dorman Museum. But that was just the start of, a, of hard work to try and raise the necessary funds. And Mr. Lyons was incredibly patient, for, for which we are eternally grateful because it did take years, a number of years, to secure, secure funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund, the VA Purchase Grant Fund, the Art Fund, and of course, Middlesbrough Council and, and private donors as well. We needed money to not only purchase a collection, but we also wanted to have the capacity to, to build a gallery that will be do justice to the quality of the objects. And Mr. Lyons was also incredibly generous in donating material and his archive, and um, the results of decades of research on Dresser, which is a valuable and, and unique resource. Uh, he was also instrumental in the setting up of the Christopher Dresser Society, which grew up out of a cl collaboration with Teesside University and, and spawned our Dresser Fests, um, of which we've had three. Um, over the last couple of years, the society has really had to rely on our social media channels um, to continue the work of promoting Dresser. But hopefully, um, next year or the year after, we will once again have a physical Dresser Fest and be able to welcome all our enthusiasts together in one building. Um, but we're very, we're very proud to have the um, Harry's uh, collection on display at the Dorman Museum. And it's, um, it's opened up sort of a lot of new avenues. We've met a lot of interesting people. Um, and sort of, we do, because of the worldwide reputation of Christopher Dresser, we do get a few international inquiries at the Dorman Museum, which is, which is always quite exciting. Um, but I have to say that the email from Curtin Museum was, was one of the more usual. Um, an image from one of our panels taken by one of the Dorman Museum's former curators and then put up on Flickr. It seemed a very convoluted route <laughs> to, to get to us. But I was delighted to be able to help us. To be honest, we, we have been a bit flummoxed by inquiries in the past as they can be quite specialised. Um, however, in this case, I instantly recognised the Kirkland Museum's five-legged chair because it is virtually identical to a chair we had previously had on display in our dresser gallery on loan from Harry Lyons. As he has been, very, been so very generous with his time and sharing his expertise over the years, I took advantage of his goodwill once again um, and asked Mr. Lyons if he had any additional information that would help um, that I could provide to the Kirkland. And he did very kindly respond and 
Over to you, Harry, if you'd like to tell us all the information that you've accumulated. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak about the Kirklands Museum's acquisition of a five-legged chair and to congratulate the Kirkland Museum on its acquisition. In Dr. Christopher Dresser's book, The Principles of Decorative Design, 1873, Dresser suggested that chairs did not need to have four legs. I quote, there is no reason whatever why a chair should have four legs, end of quote. And he further included a sketch of how a five-legged chair might possibly look. Over a period of 30 years, I kept this suggestion at the back of my mind while visiting auctions and antique fairs until February 2009, when I saw a pair of walnut five-legged chairs come up for auction in Britain. These chairs were described as, quote, probably retailed by Liberty, uh, Liberty being the fashionable store in London at that point of time, and has been since 1875. Here is an image of the chairs from the auction catalogue. The chairs struck me immediately as indeed liberty, dating from the 1880s. They were of a strong construction with struts between the leg stretchers and the seat in a manner reminiscent of Liberty's Thebes stool, which was registered in 1884. As you can see, the picture on the left is a image of the stool from the registration documents in 1884. And on the right is a standard Liberty stool as sold in the 1880s. There were variations on that. In 1883, the year before the Liberty, Liberty registration of the Thebes stool, it was a significant year in the story of both Dresser and Liberty. In 1883, the Arts Furnishers Alliance, which I'll hereafter refer to as AFA, um, a new store in fashionable London's Bond Street collapsed into bankruptcy after only two years of operation. Both Dresser and Liberty had a substantial interest in the Arts Furniture Alliance. Dresser was the art director of the AFA with the aim of promoting good design at affordable prices to the widest section of society. The AFA also proclaimed that it would staff its store with educated assistance to advise customers. And here we should remember that there was an expanding middle class in London often the first generation of their families to have a disposable income and aspiring to do the best for their families. When it came to furnishing, their new villa, few had much experience of what this entailed. In the AFA, there was an extensive collection of well-designed goods on display to furnish a new villa from the kitchen to the drawing room many of which were on sale or return to their manufacturers. The AFA also undertook to source from outside other items not in stock to meet the preferences of a customer. Now I detail this background because Arthur Liberty, the founder of the London store of that name, also had an interest in the AFA as an investor. Liberty's involvement in the store does require some explanation, as his store was only some 500 metres distant in Regent Street, as opposed to the AFAs in Bond Street. Both Liberty and Dresser were well acquainted from the 1860s, 
when Liberty began his employment in the store, Farmer and Rogers, an Oriental store, and he was in charge of the Oriental department. During the 1870s, both frequently attended Oriental auctions at Christie's. Dresser at that time was art advisor to the retail company, Charles Reynolds, importing decorative arts from across the world, particularly from the Orient. And you can see the list of buyers in the Christie's archives. And both Dresser and Liberty were regular attendees and purchasers. By 1880, Dresser was already contributing textile designs to Liberty. This can be confirmed by Dresser's description of himself on the Dresser family tree, uh, constructed circa 1880, uh, but re-edited in the early 20th century, and that he was an Orientalist and, quote, designer for Liberty. We have no documentary evidence as such to explain Liberty's reasons for investing in the AFA, but a reasonable interpretation would suggest that Liberty was to supply articles from the Middle East and the Orient, bearing in mind that the AFA was set up to buy items from manufacturers on sale or return. In addition, the AFA offered to source items from outside and not in stock, to suit a customer's preference. With the collapse of the AFA, both men were free of any AFA obligations. We do not know the precise arrangement for the wind-up of the AFA, but we do know that the receiver allowed the AFA to complete some contracts already reached. One example is the furnishing of the main reception hall for the chemical by the chemistry company of Saibegapan, or the pharmaceutical company, Burroughs and Wellcome, uh, of their headquarters. And the, also another prestigious uh, contract was the furnishing of an ocean liner, which was to sail between Melbourne and Brisbane before the infrastructure in Australia was properly organised. It would also appear that the furniture produced by the furniture maker Thomas Knight for the AFA was deployed to Liberty. In 1884, the trade magazine, The Cabinet Maker, illustrated Liberty chairs, one of which can be documented as Thomas Knight and also very firmly as Dresser and is now in the Dorman Museum collection. The Cabinet Maker described these chairs as anglo moresque as illustrated in the two images. On the first image, you can get the chair which was in the Dorman Museum on the left, and two other chairs which bear all the hallmarks of being dresser. In the second image, we have a five-legged chair illustrated in the Cabinet Maker 1884, and two other chairs both of which could certainly be run as dresser. Uh, one of which on the right is a frequent uh, sort of inhabitant of our auctions. The extension of Liberty's range of retail items from Oriental pre-1880 to Egyptian and Moori styles may be well the result of both men's involvement with the AFA which involved the completion of an AFA contract with the pharmaceutical company Burroughs and Wacom to fit out their new reception hall in the Moorish style. I believe that Dresser supplied furniture designs on his own account to Liberty, both before 83 and after, until the mid-1880s, by which time Liberty's own in-house uh, team uh, initiated in 1883, was in a position of trust, and I support the Kirkland Museum's attribution of the chair to Dresser. One footnote to this, Liberty store developed from what was originally an oriental store into a complete range of domestic furniture after the collapse of the AFA, and indeed by 1890, 
Liberty was offering a service similar to uh, the AFA to its customers, thereby, I'm glad to say, continuing the legacy of the AFA. But perhaps this is for another presentation. I have also been asked to comment on the furnishing fabric of the Kirkland's chair. This fabric, known as Hera, has traditionally been associated with liberty for much of the 20th century. The first record of Hera is its registration by William Fry and Company, Dublin, as a woven silk furnishing fabric in 1876. The design was re-registered as a cotton fabric design in 1900 by the textile company Rossendale. The same year as we see the Liberty Archives making their first record of the use of Hera. That on the right is an image of the December 1876 registration. That on the right is the cotton fabric of 1900. Dr. Drusser sold designs to both William Fry and to Rossendale, and he is known for and documented as having recycled his designs between companies and on occasion materials. Well done, the Kirkland. All right, everyone, we are going to gather all of the um, other speakers with me for a Q&A. Please put any questions you have about any of the programs today or anything else that came to mind in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. As we are getting organized, I want to take a moment um, for a few, few last minute administrative things. Um, first, I just want to thank everyone who has attended today and all of our speakers. I also want to especially thank the um, staff at Dorman Museum and Kirkland Museum who made this possible today and all of the members of the Christopher Dresser Society, specifically um, my colleagues Becca Goodrum and Chal Melia for helping run this program today, our uh, co-curator Christopher Heron and founding director and curator Hugh Grant who assembled this beautiful collection that we've shared with you today. Um, and then the other folks who are able to join us, the experts in the field, Carrie Lyons, who is just remarkable and um, joining us momentarily, Martin Filler, who I'll introduce. Okay, we're learning how to do this today. All right, um, I would like to welcome Martin Filler, a prolific collector who, along with Rosemary Hogbletter, gave a generous donation of aesthetic and dresser works to Kirkland Museum, which inspired our exhibition. We've invited him to join us for the collector's perspective. So, uh, Martin, do you mind if I start with a question for you? Not at all. So can you tell us a little bit about what draws you to Dresser's work as a collector and how you how you came to collect it? Well, my wife and I were uh, both um, architectural historian, uh, st students of architectural history at Columbia in the 1960s, and uh, were very much influenced by one of the classic uh, treatments uh, uh, of this subject of, of, of modern design, uh, Nicholas Pevsner's Pioneers of Modern Design of 1936. And that was published just 32 years after Christopher Dresser's death. And in fact, it represented a, a sort of a critical rediscovery of Dresser after about three decades of obscurity. What interested us um, when we got to learn more about Dresser's work is that Pevsner very much stressed the pre-modernist aspects of Dresser's design. That is to say things that led up to what he saw in 1936 as the culmination of modernism which is to say the international style, things which look machine made and which had a, a, a what we call a high modernist um, aspect. 
About two decades later, we became friendly with one of the great pioneering American collectors of dresser, Paul F. Walter, who was a trustee of the Museum of Modern Art, a very, very generous donor of dresser pieces, both there and to uh, the Metropolitan Museum. And um, uh, we began to see a much broader range of dressers' designs, not just proto-modernist, but with all sorts of um, historicizing and ethnographic influences. And we, we, we just were completely taken by the richness and the expansiveness of his vision, specifically at a time when the definition of modernism was seriously beginning to change with the postmodern movement. And we realized that everything wasn't just a reductive minimalist aesthetic. Um, in the 1980s, I was uh, uh, an editor at Condé Nast magazines in New York. And in the period of very lush budgets and international travel and expense accounts, I found myself in London about six times a year. Rosemary would be teaching um, a college professor of Bow of, uh, of art history and architectural history. And I'd be on my own devices in London. And one of the great discoveries I made was Kensington Church Street which I called my street of dreams. This was a, um, a, a, a commercial north-south street uh, between Kensington High Street and Notting Hill Gate in West London uh, that was lined at the time with a series of remarkable shops that were focusing on aesthetic movement and arts and crafts uh, antiques, which at the time um, seemed remarkably inexpensive. And um, it was just a complete Aladdin's cave of ridges and I would start working my way up the street um, from Kensington High Street calling in at Richard Reeves, a, a wonderful dealer who had uh, uh, marvelous objects, and then moving up slightly north and crossing the street to New Century, which was the gallery founded by Harry Lyons, who became a very dear friend. And it was extremely moving for me to see him um, so hale and hearty today, but also um, to remind us of the remarkable contribution that commercial dealers have made to the scholarship in the decorative arts. Uh, when Rosemary and I were in college, the decorative arts were considered a minor subject, um, not really worthy of, of, of a, a doctoral dissertation for sure. Uh, they were looked down upon as some sort of little ancillary uh, aspect to the big, big picture of, of, of uh, 19th and 20th century architecture. And um, Harry, in his pioneering scholarship and amazing um, investigative skills, which I attribute to the little known fact of his first career, which was in British intelligence, a subject he basically doesn't talk about much, but he, he reinvented himself into to a world-class scholar. And I think the inestimable contribution he's made to the Dresser studies can't be uh, overestimated. Thank you for that, Martin. And thank you for all of the beautiful objects you contributed. Well, uh, uh, just a, one final thought I wanted to add is that uh, another great collector friend of mine in the United States once said to me, there are doors of opportunity that open in the world of collecting. You don't know how long they're going to be open. You don't know how long they're going to last. And when a door of that sort opens, make sure you take advantage of it. And there was certainly a golden age of collecting uh, around Kensington Church Street in the 80s, 90s, and into the early years of the hundreds, when I think for a variety of commercial reasons, I think the um, rise of the internet and e-commerce, um, changing real estate values in that part of London, um, and let's face it, a changing shifts of taste when um, um, young people today are much more interested in, in, in many instances in, in mid-century, 20th century modernism than in the aesthetic and arts and crafts movement. But in a way, um, uh, we've found these objects uh, that we've been living with for the past 30 years to be remarkably enriching on a daily basis. And we feel very fortunate to have had that window of opportunity in London uh, so many years ago. I think that's an excellent point. Um, we had one question, maybe Martin, you'd like to give your perspective and then maybe Harry would chime in as well. Someone said, Christopher Dresser, pioneer of modernism, but should could we also he's, say he's the pioneer of postmodernism? 
Um, I don't much like the term postmodernism, mm -hmm. uh, especially since it's been very, um, I think with even the perspective of 30 years on say postmodernist architecture of the, uh, of the 1980s seems to have been an insubstantial minor aberration. I think the modern movement continues. It's always been richer and more varied than has been purported by, by many historians. Um, but certainly um, in his grasp of the um, uh, full exploitation of machine manufacturing and um, a breadth of cultural influence, I think this is the, the major contribution uh, that certainly cements Dresser as one of the really towering figures in, in the history of design. Thank you for that. I, I just want to add really quickly, we have Ian Stubbs um, commenting, he contributed that original Flickr photograph and we just want to shout out to him. Thank you so much for making this connection inadvertently that that allowed us to attribute the dresser chair. Uh, we now believe we're the only museum publicly displaying the chair attributed to dresser. And so we're so grateful. Um, but now, Harry, do you do you want to comment on that or anything else? Uh, yes, I, I agree with my very dear friend Martin. Uh, what is postmodernism? So, um, modernism stopped in the 1930s, uh, perhaps. It certainly carried on well into the 50s because the uh, Second World War, nothing happened. Um, yes, uh, it was innovative and uh, Yes, uh, it was a precursor of uh, modernism, as far as I'm concerned, and uh, the evidences are, are in the pieces themselves, uh, particularly in the metalwork and glass. Mm. Wonderful. Um, Harry, while you're speaking, or I don't know if you want to pass this to Jill, someone asked um, about the cause of the lack of marking on Dresser's grave. Was that just due to the activities of the World War? Oh, sorry, the lack of mark on Dresser's grave. Yes, he died um, in Malus, in which was in France at the time. Oh, was it, sorry, it's in Germany at the time, and then uh, it's now actually in France. And because it was on the border, um, yes, I mean he, he would have been buried in a marked grave, but then because of the conflict and you know, sort of with with the world with World War One, we don't know exactly where he is buried mm -hmm. anymore. So. And it'd be very difficult to uh, identify him. I mean, uh, yes, yeah, it's uh, it's just unfortunate. For sure. And Harry, do you see that as partly attributable to his lack of fame at, at that time? And perhaps even now, he seems to have less of a stature than some of his contemporaries, although we think he's certainly deserving of as much. So you, do, would you like to reflect on that? Yes, as somebody who's probably a little bit older than most of the others uh, viewing tonight, I, I can remember the great abhorrence of anything Victorian. When I was growing up, it was getting dumped everywhere. Uh, Dresser died in 1904 when um, Art Nouveau was taking over. And uh, I think really it was the family with the male man gone, if I dare risk that sort of analogy, uh, they didn't follow up uh, trying to get any memorial for the grave. When he died, it was the studio manager and the eldest son, Louis Leo, who actually worked for Liberty, uh, who uh, attended in Mulhouse where he died, spelt Mulhouse, and um, nothing happened. There was no memorial on it. And after 30 years, uh, if that is not registered or any attempt to commemorate the grave site, uh, the bones were dug up and they, what they call sent to an ossuary, i.e. a bone <laughs> place. Um, sad, but uh, we have been in contact with one or two people in the loons um, about getting a memorial, but it's a little bit at the moment like pushing a car uphill with a handbrake on. Linda, would you like to jump yeah, in? Yeah, can I just say that it's interesting, if that's the right word to use, that when he died, there's no mention in British newspapers at all. 
you think that there would be a quite a long obituary and quite a lot of information, but there isn't very much. So, as you say, if he if he was not as famous when he died as he had been during his life, that I suppose would explain that. Well, it's wonderful uh, to see that we're all working on changing that. One further point is uh, the victory. Uh, I believe it was in the Architect mm -hmm. magazine uh, did say that um, there would have been much more uh, fuss made of dressers uh, passing had it been a few years earlier, uh, because he had uh, more or less retired from he's leaving the work to the studio at the end. And uh, he wasn't uh, sorry coming forward with uh, groundbreaking designs. And I think that mm. faded. That makes sense. Mm. Uh, Becca, do you want to tell us something that you love learning about Dresser? Oh boy, sure. Um, Any of the rest of you can answer this question as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I've just really become obsessed with him over the past year. Um, I call myself his newest fan girl. So I really just, I like what everyone kind of has mentioned today, the way that his designs, you can look at them and they feel so modern. There's a um, design drawing in the collection of the Met and um, it's in the open domain. So I bought a uh, serigraph print of this um, design and it looks very modern. I hung it up on my wall at home and every person that comes in, I love them thinking that it's a, it's a contemporary modern piece. And then I, I tell them like, no, it's actually from 1883 or earlier and just seeing the look on their face when you tell them that that happens over and over again with dressers designs and i just i love that and like during your tour maya of the sugar bowl um that alessi can reproduce his designs in the 1990s and today and we still buy them because they still look so modern and they still hold up and for someone to be able to design something in the late 1880s that holds up today i just i find him fascinating and I just, I'm a new, I'm a new and a uh, lifelong fan, I think. <laughs> Great. Uh, someone has asked, do any of our panelists have any advice for collectors seeking out dresser designed objects today? Does anyone want to take that? Hmm. Well, I would just say immerse yourself in the literature because so much of the um, dresser material is not signed. And one of the Another extraordinary um, uh, contribution that, that Harry Lines has made is his rating system of, of definitely known documented dresser, quite likely dresser, I and mean, the sort of gradations of, of attribution. But I think the more you look, the more you inform yourself. And as Paul Walter once said to me at the beginning uh, of my collecting aesthetic period uh, work, when there was not too much in the way of contemporary um, publications, he said, none of us were born knowing this stuff. You know, we've all had to educate ourselves to, to one degree or another. And another, another um, bit of advice I would give is to act fast. One of my favorite collecting stories was going to visit an, another pioneering uh, dressing, dresser collector, the late John Scott, who unfortunately died last January um, at the age of 84, just shortly before the pandemic. And he had the most marvelous loft-like space in Labrick Grove in London, and I would often call in on him on my visits. And I was on one particularly um, crowded visit in the early years of this century. And I went to see him as my last call in London before heading out to Heathrow for the 6.30 plane back to New York on British Air, which I always took so I could get one last day of shopping in. And as I was about to leave John's house he said to me now martin if you're clever you will stop off at michael whiteways and snap up a pair of extraordinary dresser fire dogs that he just got the day before yesterday they're the finest examples i've seen on the market in 30 years i said but on my way to the airport with my luggage and the and the phone cab is about to arrive and he just looked at me he said a word to the wise is sufficient 
So I got into the taxi and I said, Heathrow, but first we have to make a quick stop on Kensington Church Street. So I had the taxi driver pull in and I rushed into Haslam and Whiteway. Um, Michael was as usual, huddled in the basement in his little dark windowless Dickensian office. He was a very shy and reticent person. And I said, where are the dresser fire dogs and how much do you want for them? And he was just so startled, he looked at me. I said, I've got a taxi waiting. And he said, 800 pounds. I said, sold. And well, <laughs> his, his assistant ran up the credit card receipt. He wrapped them up and I was in and out within five minutes. And he had a look of utter shock on his face. That they were, in fact, magnificent pieces, even though we did not have a fireplace to display them in. But we kept them on uh, a Talbert console table for many years as a sort of faux fireplace surround. And um, eventually um, made a very handsome profit uh, 20 or so years later uh, when we put them up for sale at Sotheby's. But in any case, I was very glad I acted quickly. One of the things I always told myself because I would make the rounds of Ken Church Street on my first day in London and then I'd usually decide what I wanted to buy on the next to last day. And sometimes I would go back and a piece would be missing. And I said, well, what happened to it? And they said, well, it's sold. You know, this is not a museum, it's a shop. So I think sometimes acting decisively um, is very important in terms of, of, of collecting as well. I think I would say, be very careful and do your homework, which is more or less what you just said. <laughs> mm. um, <clears throat> Great advice. I don't think we should overlook eBay if uh, we're talking to somebody who's asked the question, uh, where, can, where can we start now? Uh, but affordable, uh, yes, eBay still has the odd bargain if you're quick and careful, but there's also many pitfalls, as I'm sure you may well be an, um, aware of uh, with eBay, and that is, it depends upon the honesty of the person listing it. And uh, you can't really tell if something has been restored, uh, should that matter to you. Um, Otherwise, uh, you take your chance at auctions, but you'll probably find everybody else has spotted it as well. <laughs> uh, someone has asked, what happened to dressers' uh, papers and artifacts? Is there an archive? Um, I suspect most of them were dumped. Uh, you have to go back to 1940, the 40s. Three sisters were living in a village outside Guildford, uh, not far from London. Um, and they were, of course, aging at that time. The eldest would have been in the late 80s, and the youngest was uh, Nellie, uh, who was the last survivor. She was still middle 70s. But um, this was the Second World War. And uh, when the last person died, uh, leaving Mary, the oldest, 88, um, Nellie decided it's, we'll have to move her closer to me where I can keep an eye on her. She, it was at the top of a very large hill and uh, about half a mile walking downhill and back up again to the shops. And uh, I just think, and getting somebody to move from near Guildford to where Nelly lived, which was the other end of London, uh, in wartime, when everything, uh, petrol you couldn't get, and uh, everything was rationed, and uh, most of the men folk who would have been involved in doing it were at the front. Uh, I just think she probably shook her head and said, uh, Dump it. Nobody has uh, valued our father since he died. So uh, why are we persevering? Are there any family members um, promoting his work? Do you have grandchildren or anyone? Uh, not that we've identified. Direct descendants, uh, although some do exist, but uh, promoting his work, no. Here's a good question. Uh, why do you think Morris got recognition and not Dresser? Was it because Morris was better connected to people with influence? 
I think it was because Morris was connected to art and Dresser was connected to manufacture. And I think that probably had an impact on why he might not have been so popular in uh, establishment circles. I don't know. That's just my personal opinion. Back um, to Martin's on. point about the value of decorative art. Huh? Well, yeah. All, yeah, also, uh, I would say that um, also William Morris is one of the great self-promoters of the 19th mm -hmm. century. It didn't just yeah. extend to art. It was also <laughs> his, his political and socialist activity. So this was a man who knew how to put himself and his name forward from beginning to end. And I think that the, the sheer outpouring of, of design work um, from Dresser indicates that that's what he was doing with his time. It was just, uh, he was just a fount of creativity that didn't stop. And I think he thought the work would sell itself, which to an extent it did, but he didn't sell himself in the same way that William Morris did so effectively. One of the reasons we started to do what we're doing is that a teacher came to the Dorman Museum and said, we're doing the Victorians. We'd like to do some design. Do you have any William Morris? And they had never heard of Christopher Dresser. This was a Middlesbrough school. So that was when we thought we ought to be doing a bit more promotion of this man's activities. I think we need to come in on that one, Linda. Yes, uh, my colleague Sue is sitting next to me. I, I, I was actually the person that took that telephone call. And that was the start of sort of making sure that every school child in Middlesbrough knows the story of Linthorpe Pottery and Christopher Dresser. And Sue's still carrying the mantle. And yes, she is. Making... she is. She is, yes. And that, was, that was Linthorpe School as well. Linthorpe School is literally a couple of yards <laughs> Just around the corner. <laughs> Just around yes, the corner. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well done, Sue. <laughs> Further to what... Um... Martin and Linda have said. Um, yes, I agree with that. One extra point, I think, which is possibly of importance, uh, was made by a friend of mine, Christopher Morley, some time ago. Uh, Morris had a shop. Mm -hmm. Not Morris himself, but there was a shop in Oxford Street which existed through until the beginning of the Second World War. So the name was always there. Mm -hmm. And that is on... Uh, in addition to the points already made, Dresser was connected with industry, which was almost a dirty word, and uh, Morris was art and middle class. Yes, excellent points. Okay, I think we've made it through all of the questions that have been asked. I think... Shall feel free to pop in. I think we asked those. Um, do any of the rest of you, well, anyone listening, please feel free to continue asking questions in the chat or the Q&A. Do any of our speakers have any questions for each other or final points that you would like to make? I think we I'm need working on the thesis. Sorry, go, go ahead. No, 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 no. I was just going to say that I think we need fairly soon um, a meeting of the Christopher Dresser Society, and we need to up our recruitment campaign, and we need to get our act together rather than just sit around talking about it. So that's the plan for this year. So as chair of the Christopher Dresser Society at the moment, that's what we're going to do. Harry, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I, I was thinking uh, on the core substance of this uh, latter bit of the talk, uh, the five-legged chair. Uh, it has made me think very much about how liberty uh, morphed into what the AFA, the Art Furnishers Alliance, started out to do. And uh, <laughs> Documentary evidence is thin on the ground, but I do believe that um, Morris and Dresser uh, had met, but more importantly, Liberty. Liberty and uh, Dresser had been acquainted for some time and uh, Dresser's influence was there and Mor uh, Liberty was happy to follow uh, 
Dresser's advice to join up in the AFA. And uh, he took over. And at one point, they were offering designs for house for, uh, fitting. Food for thought. That's great. <laughs> Well, I want to um, thank you all so much again. Uh, that brings our day of celebrating Dr. Christopher Dresser to a close. Uh, we will send a follow-up email on Monday asking a couple more little survey questions if you're willing to take a couple moments to help us continue to connect with you on your interests. And um, if you enjoyed your experience, please do consider a donation to make future programming like this one possible. You can reach out directly to the Dresser Society at ChristopherDresser at Hotmail.com. Put that in the chat. And I'll also put a link to Kirkland Museum's donation page if you feel generous and um, able to continue our programming. Um, if you join our email list, which you'll have a chance to do from our email on Monday if you're not already a member, um, we will send out information about virtual tours we're going to run about our temporary exhibition once a month for the rest of the fall and other news about the museum. Um, and we're just very grateful to, again, the Dorman Museum, Christopher Dresser Society, and all of the staff at Kirkland Museum, and then especially to Martin Filler and to Harry Lyons for all of their contributions to this exhibition and day. We will include links to the parts of the program that we've been able to share um, in the email on Monday, which you will all receive. And if you have any follow up questions, please feel free to reach out to us at rsvp at kirklandmuseum.org, which I'll put in the chat again. Can I just thank say you. thank you to you and to Becca and to Louise for making this possible because it was a brilliant idea. Well done. We're here. <laughs> thank you all so much. It really was a joy. Hope to see you all soon. Bye. Thank you.